Welcome to another recording of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 373. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Alan Haley. And today is February 21st, 2018. Oh, we'd like to welcome Alan back to the show. When you don't see Alan frequently, this means there's not a lot of legal news or um, stuff like that. He's also a busy person. I guess you get your hands in a lot of cases going on over in Washington. Well, yes, trying to help out there. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. My lawyer, the family lawyer, is always busy, but his law practice is family law, and he has all, oh. a million little things, you yeah. know, uh, to keep up with. Whether, you know, uh, Aunt Martha had her mailbox knocked over, and uh, somebody wants to sue them because it scratched their car, you yeah. know, all these little minor things, and and everybody like me wants a will, so uh, yeah. law is busy. Um, and I want to talk to you about that because last week we uh, learned that the South Carolina was going to, had filed a petition with the Supreme Court. Correct. And I kind of want to talk about how that works. I know that uh, at some point the justices sit down at their conference table and discuss these things. And right. uh, it's called the Friday Conference. If, I thought you could tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Well, a petition for certiorari. In fact, they may have one here I could show you. Looks like Nah. Don't see it. Uh oh. There we go. Okay. And um it's just a little booklet as you see. It's okay. bound um it's bound and stapled and it's printed formally printed so that they see and, and there's hundreds of these that come in every week to the supreme court clerk's office and they all get duly filed and listed for uh, consideration and they have um, a pool of um, clerks that review each petition and write up short notes and then they prepare extracts for the their justices they say here's the hundred that arrived this week here's one or two you might want to look at the rest of them i think you might want to skip or whatever so it's gotten worse but justice gorsuch recently announced like not recently but he's followed a practice since joining the court he reads every single petition that comes in wow that's that's pretty awesome now i understand that you know that the conference they don't allow anybody in there except the judges it's kind of like a judicial conclave that's right they meet every friday when the court's in session and it's kind of a, I think, an extended luncheon mm -hmm. meeting. Um, but there's only the justices present, and they um, have a, a two things on their agenda. First, to deal with existing cases that have been argued, and second, to deal with new cases that have just been filed and briefed. So right now, the, um, South Carolina filed its brief. The Episcopal Church group has 30 days within which to file a response. If it wishes, it doesn't have to. Um, and then it can also ask for an extension, which is usually granted. Then there's a reply brief, which again is optional. Um, and they, But once the respondent's brief is on file, within two weeks or so, it's scheduled for a conference. Uh, that means that, that both briefs have been read by the clerks or by Justice Gorsuch. And then they come up to the conference, they're sitting around and they say, it takes four votes of a just of the four justices to accept a petition for certiorari to review, and so probably what happens is the chief justice will ask, "Does anyone have any petitions that they want to have us consider and, and recommend that we accept?" And they go around, and each justice then has a chance to prop say what um, cases he would like reviewed. And if there's four of them backing it, why then that's a that's an it, that's an acceptance. They publish or wow. accept review on this. That doesn't happen very often. Um, a lot of conferences go by and there's no cases accepted for review. So case accepted for review, does it then go before the court or they're just, it's yeah. a review process? Then it's set up for full briefing. Okay. The, uh, the petition briefing is just the cursest, of, uh, shortest of briefs to say why they should accept it for review. But then you go to a full brief on the merits a full response brief on the merits and a full reply brief and then it's it's also set for a date for argument so if for example uh, my guess is that we will have a conference the judicial conference concerning this petition 
will happen some uh, Friday in May. And so the following Monday morning, we'll see from the orders list that is published whether a review was granted or denied. If review is granted, the case will then be set on the calendar for full argument, probably very late next year in November, December, or depending on how full the calendar already is with cases that have been previously accepted, it could be pushed into early January, February of 2019. And so the, um, and then there wouldn't be a decision probably until toward the end of of the term in June 2019. So we're a ways away from anything happening, but it was interesting because the, this was a well-written brief. It lays out the problems why the Supreme Court should accept this case because the Jones v. Wolf decision, which it handed down 40 years ago in 1979, has been misread by half of the courts that have dealt with it, and we've now got a huge uh, divide in the nation's courts um, about eight versus eight, uh, reading it one way versus another way. And this is exactly the kind of thing that the Supreme Court is tailored to take care of and resolve. When the courts don't agree, it's the final word and said, this is the way you should read Jones v. Wolf. They say neutral principles of law in Jones v. Wolf, but then they also said, of course, we can accommodate churches if they will come up with anything that resembles a trust in, that the law can recognize. And so the courts have gone picked on which language they want there and some say oh the Episcopal Church and other churches that are of a, a big structure like that with a national governing body uh, they get to do it from the national from the top down they can publish a canon and put everything in trust that way they don't have to go through the individual states uh, and record documents the way everyone else has to and the response to that of course is well no wait a minute what makes the Episcopal Church or the Presbyterian Church so special uh, why do they get special treatment just because they're a church? This is neutral principles of law, it's supposed to apply the same to everyone. <laughs> and so there's nothing wrong with <laughs> making them, having them make trusts like everyone else has to make a trust. So that's the competing argument and we hope that the Supreme Court will see the way to accept it. Probably Gorsuch, uh, who's a, an Episcopalian himself from Colorado, um, I hope he would be sufficiently, his sense of justice would be sufficiently offended by the way that South Carolina, the shoddy way in which the South Carolina Supreme Court resolved the case. And well, I does, would hope you would want to do something. Does the petition speak at all about the foul decision made in South Carolina? Well, it attaches the documents. Okay. Um, so the court can see for itself what happened. And uh, another person I would hope might, whose sense of justice might be offended by this is uh, Justice Thomas, who also himself used to be an Episcopalian. But as for the other two votes, we're going to have to have convince a Jew or a Catholic of the among remaining justices in the court. Um, the, I think it's evenly split between the Catholics. And, no, let's see. There's only three Jews and three and six Catholics. That's right, yeah. 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 So anyway, um, we'll have to see what what happens there. But we'll, it'll be May what, before we know anything. Is my guess. When we were doing our pre-show, uh, we're talking about South Carolina and the Second Amendment. Yeah, Kevin, we should also talk about Texas. Yeah. Oh, uh, Texas. <laughs> I Texas. completely forgot about Texas. There it's is a, a, long forgotten a, case. <laughs> a Supreme Court decision that I'm sure it's been decided, but we don't know what the, the results are. Well, okay. First of all, it's not the Supreme Court of Texas this time. Okay. It's just the Court of, court of Appeal oh, in Austin. Of, I'm glad yeah. you remembered that because I thought it was the Supreme Court. Okay. Yeah. The Episcopal Church has an appeal uh, up from the decision against it in the trial court that it uh, would, did not succeed to take over the properties there in Texas because the Dennis Cannon is, is not recognized in Texas as creating any kind of trust on its own. And so um, that has been on appeal now for well over, I mean, two years, I think. Um, and of course, the South Carolina Supreme Court held it almost as long uh, in the first time around on that. So, but it's still, it's very unusual for a court of appeal to sit on a decision that long. And I was trying to get some information about why, if there's any light that can be shed on this, what's taking it so long. I, I think there was a, a retirement of one of the justices who, who heard the case. He retired. And I don't know what the, if that's put them into a quandary as to what to do to replace him or to allow him to continue to participate to decide the case, mm -hmm. but I don't ha really have any information. I'm just speculating on that, and um, it's just a um, it's a mystery to me. Well, let's but, put out some feelers. If you know what's going on, send Alan Haley an email so we can find out. Um, yeah, uh, we have quite a viewership from Texas, so somebody down there uh, should be able to help us out. 
Right. Um, so the uh, that case is is pending, and then of course, depending on how it's decided, the losing party will probably take it up or ask the Texas Supreme Court to review it, which is like the U.S. Supreme Court; it doesn't have to take the case. It's can discretion can leave the lower court decision standing if it wants. So that's the news in Texas, which is no news yet, but still waiting. <laughs> that's the final case uh, of the Episcopal Church that's pending anywhere. There's some an interesting case out here in California. Um, one of the parish cases in San Joaquin, uh, they've waited until the Schofield decision was done, and now they've waited another 18, 19 months before going in and scheduling a trial on it. And the defendant there, the parish, has made a motion to the court that that's too long. They have to bring the case to trial within five years under a California statute. And the five years has come and gone, and now it's too late, so the case should be dismissed. So we'll have a decision in that case uh, probably before too long in another couple of weeks or so. In, in, in your experience, how often does a state follow their own rules? Yeah, well, this this five-year statute is well known. Everybody tries to take advantage of it if you can because it's an automatic killer. It's mandatory. Uh, every case has to be brought to trial within five years of the date it's filed. And if not, it gets dismissed. If there's, You can have some excuses, for example, if the if somebody got severely sick just as the five year was coming away. It gets told for certain reasons, but this case, the tolling period ran when the Schofield case was decided. So that's, and then they waited, they tried a couple of other cases against other parishes. They had no problem taking them to court. This one they just let sit in the back burner. And I think it's gone too long, okay. but we'll see. I often have you on the program discussing judicial things. Uh, I thought I'd talk to you a little bit today, and I warned you about this about uh, legislative things. Uh, we have a, a small itty bitty movement in, the, in this country that every time there's an attack or a mass shooting, they say we need to repeal the Second Amendment. And I feel for them, I do. Um, but I look at the um, ornus chore before them in repealing something like that. I thought I would talk to you about what it would take to repeal the Second Amendment. Well, it's for, there's two methods that can be done. Mm -hmm. Um, but basically it involves a, passing a constitutional amendment which requires a vote of, um, it has to be proposed by Congress, a two-thirds majority in each house, and then it, I think it has to go to the state legislatures where it has to be ratified by three-quarters of the states. So that's one method. The other method is to call a constitutional convention <laughs> and have the convention propose the amendment and do that. Uh, which has never been followed. So the usual method is propose it in Congress, get their votes there, and then send it out to the states. And the states have an indefinite period within which to vote on it and accept it because this one amendment was put in, I can't remember which one it was, uh, after a state, after 15 years, changed yeah. its vote or something. Yeah, yeah that's, it, it is, it's not where you're, gonna, you're not going to find any uh, leeway structure or a foothold in trying to, to change the Second Amendment. So no. all planning needs to be w in the net full knowledge that it's going to exist um, right. for the near future. Uh, Particularly one of the original Ten Amendments to repeal one of the Bill of Rights is uh, is really an uphill battle. Mm -hmm. It's been with us since 1791 or so. Yeah, it, uh. it, it's near impossible. Um, in the same way, people want to ban scary-looking guns. And uh, I have a scary-looking gun here. Whoa. Look at that monster. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> like I got go all the way to the barrel here. Now, this is called yeah. the Morpheus. It's sold by uh, um, uh, Smith & Wesson. Uh, uh -huh. They only sold 20 of these. And, is it automatic? Uh, uh, semi-automatic? <laughs> semi-automatic, yeah. Uh, as you can you know, tell, nice little gun. Uh -huh. uh, I don't have anything left open chambered or uh, uh, closed chambered in my right. house, but uh, right. now do you see the clip. Um, to be quite honest, this is not a very powerful gun. This is just a 22 caliber gun. 22 caliber. <laughs> but boy, it shoots a lot of them. <laughs> I, could, I could take out a squirrel if I wanted to. Uh, if you got hit by this, you would just be mad at me. <laughs> I would have to run faster. Um, however, uh, the world sees something like this and they want to ban it. And yeah. I think we have a problem with definitions, like I think you said before, with Aristotle, 
our biggest problem is knowing what is what. People with guns are going to get these kinds of results. So the real issue is why? how can a crazy person get hold of a gun? And they, I know they improved background checks a little bit. In California, for example, if you've ever had any mental treatment at a mental hospital, you're prohibited from having a gun and you can't get anything and uh, your name is on a record that prevents you. So um, the, each state, of course, has to do its own job on this and I don't know what happened in Florida, how this guy got his gun, but he'd certainly been, had enough treatment and visits from everyone to know that this was a dangerous problem. Well, and he even deceived, I guess, the people he lived with um, by got, getting a second key to their gun case. One of the issues I have is that um, this generation, for whatever reason, seems a little less mature than previous generations. Uh, an 18 year old now does not have the same uh, maturity as an 18 year old from 1850. No. Be what no. it is. Um, so if yeah. people want to uh, jerry rig the aging system with the delivery of weapons, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, yeah. I, I have. I don't need. Of course, in eight, at eighteen, they at eighteen they can be drafted in the army and given a gun and taught to shoot. I'll let their sergeant <laughs> deal with that. But you know, I would have no trouble. I, I wrote this down this morning. With a eighteen-year-olds uh, can buy a single bolt weapon or a shotgun. That's it. Mm -hmm. But they have to have mandatory NRA training. Um, at twenty-one, they can buy a revolver, uh, but they have to have the M uh, NRA uh, training. I'd say at 25, you can buy a semi-automatic pistol, but you need the NRA training. Uh, at 30, you can buy an AR, uh, and uh, AR is what you just saw here, uh, mm -hmm. but it comes with training. Now, training. I have a lot of training, but I had to pay for it. It wasn't government mm -hmm. provided. Uh, each course I've taken costs $300, mm -hmm. um, but it's very good training, and uh, I'm glad I had it, uh, mm -hmm. but I also practice. Well, now I know where to go when things when everything hits <laughs> when the fan. Goes bad. <laughs> <laughs> when all goes mess, go to Kevin's basement. Oh, yeah. All right. So uh, I think we've uh, scared enough people off uh, and all that. Although all the people that gave up uh, Anglican and Scripture for Lent aren't watching now. We'll oh. have to catch up uh, in, in a couple weeks. I'm <laughs> Kevin Carlson, and I'm Alan Haley. And this has been episode 373 of Anglican Unscripted. The lawyer always gets it right. <laughs> <laughs>